Hi, I'm Tony Alisea. This is Don't Imitate, Understand. In this video, we'll answer the question, what is a relational database? Now, some people may have assumed or may have even been taught that a relational database is a database with tables that are related to each other or that have relationships. But that is wrong. So let's delve into what really is a relational database. To do that, we'll start with the basics. When we say data, we really just mean information. When we say database, we mean organized information. But information organized in a particular way, depending on the type of database. So when we say relational database, we mean information organized in a relational way, or information organized using the relational model. The relational model is an idea, an approach, a way to organize data. So a relational database is a database that organizes its information according to the ideas in the relational model. The word model, then, is just talking about ways to organize things. To understand what a relational database really is, we need to focus on the word relational. What do we mean by relational? To understand relational, we first need to understand the idea of a set. A set is a collection of things. Those things usually have something in common, like shapes. In mathematics, we might write a set like this. Now, in reality, there are many sets of many kinds of things. Let's use an example that's simple but will be useful. Suppose I have a set of first names, and I also have a set of numbers, and I also have a set of months of the year. In the relational model, we'll look at each of these sets and consider them as potential values, and we call these sets of potential values, domains. Now we need a real-world example. Suppose that we own a company, and we've been interviewing people as we look for new employees. If I want to record each interview, how could I organize that information? Well, one way would be for each interview to take one value from each of these domains and combine them together into their own set, or tuple. You note that each of the values comes from the domain, but it's when we pull them together that they begin to have meaning, that they represent something. Jane, 30, and March represent an interview, so those values are related to each other within that tuple. As we record all the various interviews that we've had, we're using values from those domains to record them. So I interviewed someone named Jane, who's 30, and they did that in March. Someone named Jane, also a different person, who's 40, interviewed in January. Jim, who's 20, I interviewed in January, etc. So we could have one tuple, or we could have many, many tuples, each one representing this interview. When I put them together, what I really made is another set another collection of things, a collection of tuples. So when I look at this entire collection of tuples, where each tuple only contains values that are pulled from domains or possible values, we call that a relation. Now in practice, you're probably accustomed to seeing a relation visually represented a little bit differently, like this, a table. But this is a relation, in particular, the contents of the table. Each individual row or tuple forms an idea, a concept, a representation of something, and each value in that tuple comes from some domain, some set of possible values. This is a way of organizing information for it to be consistent, for it to be reliable. Now let's change our data a little bit to be a bit more realistic. 
and then think about those domains. Now, for example, the name domain, we listed some names, but there's a lot more names than that in reality. So in a real world setting, we might have a very large set that is our domain. For example, I could say, take up to 255 letters and combine them any way you want. And all the possible combinations is our domain, our set of possible values. Now that's very large, but it's finite. It's not infinite. So any value that I have in the tuple, in the relation, has to come from that set of all possible combinations. The same is true for age. Maybe I just say it's a number. Anything from negative 32,000 to positive 32,000 is how I define my domain, a really big set. And the same with dates, another large set. But we're still limiting the possible values in the tuple to come from those domains. Now, in a real-world database, these ideas might look something like this. A var car, an integer, a date. They're usually large sets, many, many possible values, but they're still finite. In the relational model, the idea is called a domain. In practice, it's called a data type a set of possible values which your value in your table is going to match. And that's right, the relation is a table, specifically the contents of the table, not the structure. It's that collection of rows. So now we can define the word relation. Big word alert. A relation it's a set of tuples where each element in the tuple is a member of a domain. In practice, we're referring to the contents of a table then, the set of rows. And each value in the table is limited to a data type. This is an approach to organizing information, the relational approach. Now let's go back to our table. The relational approach, the relational model for organizing information, also provides methodologies to retrieve information, to look at the data that's been stored and answer questions about that data. For example, let's take our relation and call it the people relation, and we'll add a column or an attribute as it's called in the relational model, an ID, to identify each row or each tuple. Let's suppose we have another relation. We want to store all of our current employees, but we only ever hire people that we've interviewed. So we know that any IDs we put in the employees relation will be someone that sits in the people relation. So we don't need to put more than just the ID. We don't need to duplicate information. And this is an example of why the relational approach to organizing information is efficient. Now, because we're following the relational model, any values in the employee's relation must also be limited by a data type, a domain. So let's suppose the ID is an integer. In this case, any whole number between negative 32,000 and positive 32,000. That's a lot. But we've already said that anyone that we hire is someone we've interviewed. So we can say that there is a relationship between the employee's relation and the people relation. And that's where the misconception comes in. See, the word relationship sounds like relation. But you know, in practice, when using a relational database, you often don't see the word relationship when talking about these kind of connections. Instead, you see a different word. We know that any ID in the employee's relation must match an ID in the people relation. So we can add something called a foreign key constraint. And the word constraint not only is what you often see when using relational databases, it more clearly defines what it really is. The IDs in the employee's relation can be any integer between negative 32,000 and positive 32,000 but we're going to further constrain the set of possible values. We're going to say that the constraint is it can really only be integers that appear as the ID in the people table. One, two, three, or four in this case. 
And that works because negative 32,000 to positive 32,000, 1, 2, 3, and 4 are within that set. So we've just reduced the set. We've constrained the set. And this forms what is often called a relationship. But what it really is, is a constraint. And there's other types of constraints that we can use to keep our data organized efficiently and consistently, like a primary key constraint. The people table also might say anything from negative 32,000 to positive 32,000 for the value of an ID, a very large set. But we could say whenever we add a new row, a new tuple into this relation, that it can't have a value that already exists in the table. So if we added a new row here, we could say we have a constraint. It can be any one of these numbers except for 1, 2, 3, or 4. And that keeps the values unique to each row. And then we can be certain that we can identify that row using that value. Again, these are ways to make sure the data remains consistent. And then we're able to ask questions of the data without worrying that the data is somehow incorrect. But that's not the only aspect of the relational model that we see in relational databases. It's not only important to be able to organize and store information well, it's also important to be able to retrieve information, to ask questions of the data and get the answers that we need. To do that, the relational model uses the idea of relational operators. Now, what's an operator? An operator basically is a thing that takes inputs and gives outputs. One of the first operators you probably learned in school is addition. It takes inputs, what we want to add up. Let's say 1, 3, and 5. 1 plus 3 plus 5 is the output, 9. Now, a relational operator is a similar concept. It takes in relations and outputs relations. And there can be multiple operators that take in relations or even the outputs of other operators and give out relations. It's a very powerful and flexible concept, allowing us to act on relations and get more relations back and keep chaining them together. So let's think about how this works in practice. Let's suppose we have our employees relation and our people relation. And we'd like to know the names and interview dates of the actual employees that we have currently. While we know their IDs, we need to go get the rest of the information from the people relation. That's a relational operator's job. A very common one that you'll see all across relational databases that comes from the relational model is a join. We see that we took the contents of one relation and compared the contents of another relation and pulled them together where they matched and what we got out was a new relation. Uh, two tuples with four values each, but each of those values are still members of a particular data type. It still fits the definition of a relation. Another relational operator in the relational model is called a projection. In a projection, we specify which attributes, or that is, which columns, we want in our new relation that comes out the other side. In practice, in relational databases, the select keyword is used for this. But we still are getting a relation out. And all of these relational operators and more are made accessible to you, the programmer, through a language called structured query language, which again is attempting to implement ideas that come from the relational model. And that's another important part of a relational database. So. We're looking at how things are organized and how we retrieve information, the concepts underneath and implemented by relational databases. So what is a relational database? I hope from now on you don't think about relationships, which are really constraints. Instead, you think about a particular approach to organizing information. I hope when you think about a relational database, you think about a relation, a table, or the contents of a table to be more specific. A collection of rows where each value in those rows is associated with and comes from the possible values defined by a data type. This has proven to be, over many decades, 
an excellent way to organize and retrieve information. It's relational. And that's it. This was Don't Imitate Understand. I'm Tony Alisea. If you like this content, please subscribe and keep an eye out on the descriptions of the videos as there's often coupons to my full-length courses which also follow the Don't Imitate Understand approach to learning. Happy coding.